I feel his presence here. How about you? Yes. Yeah. Praise God. You know, the Bible said that in his presence there is fullness of joy at his right hand pleasure evermore. I've often said this and I mean it tonight. I want to participate in his pleasures. If his presence offers us pleasures in him, then we ought to take advantage of that. Amen? I want us to be a part of what he's wanting to do. I know we just sat down, but if you'll stand with me for prayer and for the reading of God's word, I'll allow you to stay seated and I'll remain standing preaching for at least three hours. <laughs> you know, I, I, I just, Amen. I'll tell this story here. You know, sometimes you go to certain places and there's just no connection between the ministry of the pulpit and the pew. This one particular church that I was preaching at, it was actually a denomination called the Pentecostal Free Will Baptists. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them, but it was a revival that started out of the Azusa Street in 1906 that went east in December of 1906. And uh, G.B. Cashwell went there and preached the meeting and the Holy Ghost fell. And from that, a church called the Pentecostal Free Will Baptists were birthed because many of the Free Will Baptist Church received the baptism in the Holy Ghost in that meeting. And so they were turned out of the Baptist Church. And so that denomination was started there. And I was preaching and we were on Tuesday night. And it was just seems as if there was just no connection at all. And uh, I was getting a little worried that, you know, maybe I had missed the mark somewhere. There was a gentleman who was there who was in all actuality just about dead. He spoke really loud. You couldn't hardly understand the word he said and because he screamed at you all the time. And uh, he heard through a hearing aid. And So on Tuesday night, I got up and I made the comment. I said, I'll make a deal with you. I said, uh, if you'll back me up and say amen, we'll get out a little bit early tonight. Amen. <laughs> he looked over at his wife and just as loud as he could, he said, my God, we'll be here all night long. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, anyway, I do appreciate your support and ministry tonight and as I preach. I want you to listen intently and I want you to worship with us and get involved in the word. Let us pray as we did this morning that God will anoint me to preach. I cannot do it without him. Yes. Let's ask God to anoint you to hear because you can't receive without that anointing. Yes. And then let's ask him to have his will in his way. As a sign of surrender, might we lift up our hands, our heart, and our voices together. I want to hear you praying with me tonight. Father, in the name of your son Jesus, we do thank you and we praise you. We honor you because we know that you are in our midst to do a work. Father, I'm, I'm relying heavily upon you tonight because I know within myself I am incapable of performing the task at hand. God, I need your anointing. I need the Spirit of the Lord that I spoke about this morning to dwell heavily upon me. Father, bring back to my remembrance those things which I have studied. Let me speak eloquently. Let me speak pointedly and powerfully. Father, touch the hearer tonight. Lord, they're going to need your anointing to receive the heavy word that I'll be delivering tonight. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bind the pulpit and the pew together as one. I pray, Lord, that the ministry of the Spirit would go forth in their lives and that men and women would be changed by the Word tonight. Father, I'm asking you to cover us with your special anointing. Father, save, sanctify, fill with the Holy Ghost, heal, deliver, and set free. Let everything be done decently and in order according to Scripture. We'll be forever grateful. In the lovely name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you remain standing, reach for your Bibles and turn with me tonight to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Now just so you know, it is 641 California time. <laughs> this is the latest I have ever preached. Because it is 20 minutes to 10 back at home. First Samuel chapter 4, beginning with verse 10, please. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter. For there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen, and the ark of God was taken. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching. 
for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his yeah. eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines. And there hath been also a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. And the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate. And his neck brake, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy. And he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. I want to preach to you for a few moments tonight on protecting His presence. Protecting His presence. You may be seated. The first time that we see the Ark of the Covenant is in Exodus chapter 25. After God allowed the people of Israel to come out of Egypt's bondage, while wandering in the wilderness, God expressed to them their need for a tabernacle. In that tabernacle was to be this article, this piece of what some people think is nothing more than furniture. Yet inside of what we know as the Holy of Holies resided the Ark of the Covenant of God. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was a precious article. It was a holy article. For it was at the Ark of the Covenant that God said, I will meet with my people. In fact, His very presence hovered over the Ark. It was from the Ark that Moses was given guidance. And it was from the Ark that Moses was given instruction as to lead God's people. Now, you must understand that the ark of God, though it was built by the hands of man, it was not designed by man. Amen. In fact, the ark of the covenant was designed by Almighty God. It was specific in its diameter. It was specific in how the gold must be laid upon it. Every aspect of the ark of God was specific. Yeah. Now, inside of that ark were three items. The first was the divine inscription of the Ten Commandments. Bible tells us that with his very finger, God wrote out the Ten Commandments. Those things by which the people of God were to live and be obedient. As long as they obeyed those commands, he said, I will be your God and you will be my people. That was a very important item that rested inside of the ark. The second thing that we find there is Aaron's rod. Now the Bible tells us that in the midst of their journeys there were tribes of people and those tribes began to think to themselves that maybe we should be the high priest. And yet God had specifically chosen a man. He laid his hand upon him and anointed him for the work and for the call that he had given him. And while everybody else was arguing, God said, okay, here's what I want us to do. I want each one of these men from each tribe to come out and lay their staff before you. And tomorrow morning, whichever staff has budded or blossomed, that will be the one that I have chosen for you. And of course, the next morning, they come out and it was Aaron's rod that had budded and blossomed. So they knew that this was God's chosen and this was God's called man. So they placed that inside of the ark. And the third thing that we find is a jar of manna. It was that heavenly food that God had sent down from heaven to feed his people. 
that manna which was actually called what is it because it's what the word manna means they didn't know what it was all they knew is that when they tasted of it and when they partook of it it gave them strength to carry on and in their weakened state it gave them the, nu the nutrients it gave them the nutrition that they need to keep on their journey so they placed that inside of the ark of the covenant as a symbol as a sign that God gives us his word God gives us his calling and God gives us the nutrients that we need to continue going. Now you see the Bible tells us specifically that it was with the Ark of the Covenant that God would lead his people in direction. So if they ever wanted to go somewhere, they would not put the Ark of the Covenant in the rear. They would not put it to the left or the right. They would not place it in the middle. They always put the Ark of the Covenant in front of them because wherever the Ark of the Covenant went, they knew that that was God's direction. They knew that that was God's place for them to go. But not only did it direct them and not only did it lead them, it also protected them. You see, the Bible tells us that as long as the Ark of the Covenant was with God's people, no enemy could fight against them. Oh yeah, they may try, they may come against them as they might, but the power and the presence of God that dwelt with that Ark would fight their battles on their behalf. Now, when I look at the Ark of the Covenant and I associate it with what we have talked about even today, the power of the Holy Ghost, I am quickly recognized that literally the presence of God is a symbol of the Ark of the Covenant and the Ark of the Covenant a symbol of the presence of God. In fact, you could say that the Ark of God was an Old Testament physical representation of who the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost is because in His presence we find everything Thing that we find in the Ark of the Covenant. You see, Pentecost is not man-made. Pentecost, yes, God uses men and women in operation through the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit, but Pentecost was designed by God. The presence of the Lord is designed by Him. The presence of the Lord is operated by Him. We cannot control, we cannot manipulate, we cannot coerce His presence. It is He that uses man in His presence. It is He that uses individuals in the work of the Lord. Now, inside of His presence, we will also find the word of the Lord that thing that causes us to live right and that thing that causes us to be obedient unto God we find it in his presence oftentimes we make the statement that we do not know how to live and we just cannot live right the word of the Lord is not understandable to us and we cannot grasp what God's trying to tell us in the word but I want to tell you my friend if you'll just get in the presence of almighty God he'll reveal his word to you if you get in the presence of God he'll show you how to live right. If you just get in the presence of God, He will direct you in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. Inside of His presence, you will find the living Word of God. I feel His presence here tonight. Why don't you just lift up your hand and say, Amen. But also in His presence, will you find the calling of God? You know, we have a lot of Johnny come lately in the church today. We have a lot of men and women who because mama called them and daddy sent them, they decided that they wanted to preach the gospel. We have those men and women who they think because of their charismatic personality or because of their intellect or because of their drive and purpose that they can be called of Almighty God. And yes, they get jealous when somebody else gets position and they get jealous when somebody else gets opportunity and they think to themselves, well, surely I should be the one that's holding that position and surely I should be the call of God. But just like with Aaron's rod inside of the presence of God, he he will reveal to you those who he has anointed and he will reveal to you those who he has called I want to tell you friend a man or woman that has been in the presence of God their ministry will bear fruit and their ministry will bud and blossom you do not have to second guess you do not have to question whether or not God's anointing is upon them you will sense the presence of Almighty God you will know them by their fruit you will know them by their work I want to tell you we need some more men and women of God who have been in the presence of Almighty God, for in His presence we know our calling. In His presence we know our role. In the office of Almighty God, we can understand that yes, there are apostles, and there is a prophet, there is an evangelist, there is a pastor, and there is a teacher. The only way we will know that calling is when we have been in the divine presence of Almighty God. Church, if you want to know your role, then get in the presence of God. But also 
so inside of his presence we will find some manna. You know, I'm kind of reminded of that text that I read to you this morning in Acts. They began to question, what meaneth this? You see, they did not understand what that presence meant either. Just as the Old Testament people did not know what the manna was, they said, yes, I understand it tastes good. Yes, I understand that it feels the something, but we have no idea what in the world it is. Can I tell you, that's exactly how I feel about the Holy Ghost. There are some times I cannot describe Him. There are times when I cannot even put to words the goodness and the mercy that I feel in the presence of Almighty God. But all I know is that when I've been in His presence, it gives me the strength to keep right on going. And when I think I can't walk another day, when I can't work another day, when I can't preach another day, all I've got to do is get in the presence of Almighty God. God. And like Brother David, I can run through a troop and jump over a wall. I want to tell you, if you are weary today, if you are heaven hated, if you think you can't go any longer, do not give up. Just get in the presence of Almighty God. For in His presence, there is a sustaining power. In His presence, there is anointing to keep on going another day. Can I tell you that it is also in His presence that the church is led and directed. Now, you do not have to shout with me. You do not have to even say amen. But I'm here to tell you tonight, there are too many churches operating off of the carnal and not the spiritual. Amen. Uh, amen. We have too many churches that are making decisions based upon finances and, and decisions based upon the situation that they currently face. We have men and women who are trying to run our churches without the anointing of Almighty God. I want to tell you, if we ever get to the place that we allow carnal men and women to lead God's church, then we are in a mess. What did I tell you this morning? He said, if you want the work of the church done, then choose you out seven men of good rapport, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Can I tell you if the church is ever going to go where God wants us to go? It's not going to be by our own capability. It's not going to be because of our influence. It's not going to be because of our standing in the community. It's going to come when men and women have been in the presence of Almighty God and say, Holy Ghost, I want you to lead me. Holy Ghost, I want you, my God. I've come by California to tell somebody, let the Holy Ghost lead this church. It's time that man takes a step back. It's time that we decrease that he might increase. If the Southwest Christian Center is ever going to go where God wants us to go, we got to get out of his way and say, Holy Ghost, you direct and lead us. Yeah. Yeah. But it will also protect us. His presence will protect us. Yes, right. Can I tell you, there have been some battles that I have been in that I can honestly tell you tonight, had it not been for the Lord by my side, I would have been defeated. I have been through some struggles in my life where it had not been for the presence of Almighty God. I would not be standing in front of you tonight. But can I tell you, inside of His presence, no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against me in judgment, I shall condemn it in His presence. I can tell you greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And if God be for me, what devil can be against me? I want to tell somebody here tonight, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What is that weapon? That weapon is the anointing of the Holy Ghost for inside of his presence. We have been given the whole armor of God inside of his presence. We have been given the ability. Back to the beginning of that chapter. 
They decided that they had learned how to do it on their own. Yes. Amen. Oh. So the Bible said that they decide one day, well, we're going into battle. We can get there on our own direction. We can fight with our own capability. So let's just leave the ark of God back in Shiloh. They left the presence of God behind to go to fight a battle on their own. How many of our churches over the years who have claimed to be Pentecostal, who have claimed to have the presence of God, have somehow or another forsaken His presence somewhere else? We have decided we'll put His presence in the church of yesterday because we do not need Him now. It, it, it just took the Holy Ghost to get the church started, not to keep the church going, so let's just leave him in another era. Right. The Bible said that because they forsook the anointing, because they forsook his presence, 35,000 people were slaughtered. They were, I'm going to tell you the reason that we're losing men and women day by day in the church of America is because the church of America has left the presence of God out of our church. Come on. I'm going to preach here tonight. I, I feel it coming on. You see, we have left his presence away. We have said that we are more than capable of handling our own situations and we are more than capable of doing church in our own manner. And because we have lost the presence of God, we have men and women who because of situations and because of life and because of the things that they have to go through, they are being spiritually slaughtered. Do you think for one minute that a man or woman just wakes up on a Sunday and decides to themselves, well, today I'm going to backslide. I'm no longer going to live for the Lord. No, I'll tell you what has happened. Because the church has relegated the presence of God to another place and because we have relegated the presence of God to another era and we say we no longer need Him. Our people are spiritually dying sitting on the pews in the church of God. Our people are spiritually dying because they're not being given that life-giving substance that comes to the presence of the Lord. I want to tell you when the presence of God is not present in our midst men and women will spiritually spiritually die. Men and women will backslide on the Lord. And men and women will go to hell because we have neglected the presence of Almighty God. But I want you to take notice what happened. When they looked over the landscape and they began to realize we are being defeated. Can I tell you the greatest step to revival is when a church realizes the church is in defeat and the church is not growing. The church is not seeing people saved and the church is not seeing people filled with the spirit and the church is not doing outreach and the church is not financially gaining. When the church can realize something is wrong, that's when revival is going to take place. You see revival began to take place when all of a sudden somebody I don't know who it was. The Bible didn't tell us who it was. But somebody said, where in the world is the Ark of the Covenant? If we had the Ark, we would not be losing. If we had the Ark, our men would not be dying. Where in the world is the Ark? Something got a hold of a man in that army. And he says, we've got to go back and find where we left him. I want to tell you here today, the heart throb of this preacher is let's go back and find where we left the presence of God. I don't know when it was. Maybe it was when we lowered some of our holiness standards. Or, or maybe when it was when we decided we no longer want a Pentecostal move in the Pentecostal church. Or maybe when it was when we decided that we can do it on our own. I don't know when it was, but I'm looking for somebody in Bakersfield, California that will rise up and join this preacher and say, if I have to tear down every door, if I have to burst through every house, if I have to go through every town, I'm going to do whatever it takes until I find the presence of Jehovah again. Until I find His presence. I'm not See, they went back in the shadow. And the Bible said that they went and they found the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now notice what happens when they find the Ark. They start journeying back to the battle. You see, when you have the Ark, you're not afraid to go into battle. The Bible said, though, that as they started journeying in, notice what it said at the beginning of the chapter. That they began to shout. Pardon me right here. 
Can I tell you when the presence of God is with us, there's going to be the shout in his church. Oh, yeah. yeah. When the presence of God is with us, there's going to be some speaking in other tongues as yes. the Spirit gives the utterance. Yes. When the Holy Ghost is with us, yes. there's going to be some gifts and manifestation. There's going to be some works of the Lord being wrought. And can I tell you, because there is rejoicing in His presence, something begins to take place. In fact, the Bible said that in the midst of their shout, in the midst of their rejoicing, a shaking took place that was so strong that out of the distance, the enemy began to hear the noise of their worship. Oh, can I tell you here, my friend, I believe the Holy Ghost is trying to tell us tonight, if we'll just get back to worshiping again, it'll shake the very foundation of hell. For hell has been fighting and for hell has been attacking the body of Christ. But when we have the anointing and when we have the presence of God with us, there is a shaking that will even grab a hold of the very pit of hell. Notice what it said. When the Philistines heard this shouting, they stopped right there and they said, wait just a moment. That's the same noise we heard the last time they had the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the leader looked over at the men and said, hey, quit you men like Philistines. Literally, what he was saying is, boys, you better put on your armor. That noise that we're hearing right now is the same noise we heard when we got beat the last time. I want to tell the Southwest Christian Center that you get the anointing of the presence of God back in your midst when the shouting happens and when the tongue talk is going on and when the aisle run is happening, when the somebody bringing up the rear right flank left flank they were there but did you notice I slowed down several times in this text and I made the statement the ark of God was taken did, did that seem odd to anybody that in the middle of a fight the ark of God just gets taken The Bible never said that they put up a fight. Mm. <clears throat> the, the Bible just said that the Philistines came in and took it. Mm. How do you just take the most important thing to God's people? Right. How do you just snatch it away? It's simple. We have men like these good pastors who were on the front line. We have leaders in the church that are taking up the rear and the right and the left flank. 
We have people holding every position you can think of. But one thing that we are lacking in the church world today is somebody standing God of His presence. You see, we get so caught up in the mundane activities of church. When we've got to prepare our sermons, we've got to gather our lessons, we've got to practice our singing. We do all of these things, yet we take not the time to protect the presence of God in our churches. Amen. How in the world did they come in and snatch it away? Well, I think it's rather simple. In my thinking, in my imagination, I can see as the Philistine army is looking at the Israelites and they begin to notice now the tides have turned. Since they got the presence of God back with them, the tides have turned. So somebody in that army begins to think to themselves, well, we were winning until that showed up. So why do we not go and take that away from them? Would you, if you were not the enemy, go and get the main weapon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of the people you're fighting? Mm -hmm. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. That's what the enemy did. Mm -hmm. The enemy said, if I can just get his presence away from them, mm -hmm. we can beat them. Yes, yes. Now, I know this isn't the Ark of the Covenant, but I'm going to use it. Yes. While the general is up here and while the colonel is back here and while the sergeant is over here and while the lieutenant's over here, everybody else is doing their job, but the presence of God was left wide open. Well, gentlemen, we can't just run in to get it because if we run in to get it, they're going to recognize us and they're going to kill us. I, I have no doubt that somebody spoke of us and listen. We just killed 35,000 of their people. <clears throat> Surely somebody in our army wears the same size fatigues that they wear. So why not take some of their garments and put it on us and let us sneak into their army and just take it without them even recognizing what's been done? That's right. You see, the reason I think that's the reason that that has happened is because that's exactly what's happened in the church. Can I tell you, we've had a lot of Philistines come into the church and steal the presence of God right out of the Amen. Preacher, are you telling me that Philistines have walked into the church and literally robbed us of the presence of God? Oh, yes. Yeah. We've had Philistines of doctrinal infidelity walk right into our churches and steal the presence of God from us. What do you mean by that, Preacher. Well, I think the last time I checked, the church of God was a full gospel church. We believe in the whole counsel of God, rightly divided. And yet there have been people that have crept in unaware, the Bible said, who have literally taken the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, and they have prostituted it, they have diluted it, to the point that the gospel is no longer being delivered in many of the churches of America. Amen. We have this candy-coated, gift wrap gospel that's being preached. And, and because we have allowed that to come in to even the church of God, we've allowed many that have walked right in. And with doctrinal infidelity, they have prostituted the word of God. They have taught you a cheap grace. They have taught you that you do not have to live right to get to heaven. They have told you that sanctification is not real. They have told you that there is no such thing as speaking in other tongues. They have told you that the gifts are no longer needed in the church today. They have even said in many cases that evolution is what was right and not creation. Oh yes, I'm still talking about the church of God. We've even had some that have come into our ranks that have told us that the Virgin Mary could not have been a virgin. And there have been some that have come and said that they actually do not believe in a literal resurrection. Why in the world do you think that the presence of God is being taken from our churches when we are not preaching the whole counsel of God, when we are not delivering the truth of God's holy word? The presence of the Lord departs from us because it's only in His word that we find the words of everlasting life. It's only in His word that we know the way, the truth, and the life. It's only in the word that we know how to live. I want to tell you, friends, when we get the word back into the church, we're going to have the presence of Almighty God. It's in together, I told you that at the beginning. In the presence, we'll 
find the word. Yes. You see, I think we've forgotten that we better hold fast to the truth of Scripture. Yes. Because without it, we will lose. Right. You know, I still believe the verbal inspiration of the Bible. Yes. I still believe in one God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I still believe that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of the Father, conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, that Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, that he ascended to heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. I still believe that repentance is commanded by God for all and necessary for the forgiveness of sin. I still believe in justification, regeneration, and new birth are wrought by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. I still believe in sanctification subsequent to the new birth through faith in the word, through the blood, and by the Holy Ghost. I still believe holiness to be God's standard of living for his people. I still believe in the baptism in the Holy Ghost subsequent to a clean heart. I still believe in speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, and that it is the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I still believe in water baptism by immersion, and that all who repent should be baptized in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. I still believe divine healing is provided for all in the atonement. I still believe in the Lord's Supper and the washing of the saints' feet. I still believe in the premillennial second coming of Jesus Christ. First to resurrect the righteous dead and to catch away the living saints to him in the air. And second to reign on the earth a thousand years. I still believe, oh yes, I still believe in the eternal right or the, the eternal punishment for the wicked and eternal righteousness or eternal reward for the righteous I still believe the whole counsel of God. And if we do not preach the whole counsel of God, we will lose his presence. Amen. Right, amen. But we've also had Philistines of attitude coming. Huh. I think I talked a little bit this morning about unity. That's right. One of the greatest ways to lose the presence of God is through attitude. You let one, I don't know how you say it around here, but we say having a hair cross back in North Carolina. <laughs> you let somebody get a hair cross wave. And all of a sudden, they walk in the church with a chip on their shoulder just waiting for somebody to knock it off. That attitude, that temper that they bring into the house of God, you know what they're doing? Inch by inch. They're moving away the presence of God. You see, they didn't just go in and snatch it away. They had to move it slowly so nobody would recognize that it was, that's what's happening in the church. Because it's not just leaving us like that, we don't even recognize it. But because of the doctrinal infidelity, it's already been moved several feet. And then now the attitudes that we have have moved it even further. Because I can tell you, if there's an attitude in the church, the presence of God is not within 100 miles of your congregation. When there is discord, when there is disunity, the Holy Ghost isn't going to rule and reign there. His presence will not be manifest. Amen. Uh, that's why we must be in one accord, as yes. I spoke about this morning. Amen. And, and then we'll have church politics come in. <laughs> I think that's moved it more than just one or two inches. I think it's maybe moved it three or four feet. We've allowed little things to come in. We, we've allowed politics, not just in the church world, but in the secular. And, and we've allowed race. Slowly by surely. Slowly. Surely by surely. His presence is being moved out of the church and we don't even recognize it. Finally, it got so far gone, the people of Israel did not even know it had left. The ark of God was taken. I want to tell you here tonight, my friend. I do not care what title you have. I do not care what position you hold. The number one priority for you and I together is to protect the presence of God. I do not care if it's preaching. I do not care if it's singing. I do not care if it's ushering. I do not care if it's groundskeeper. Whatever your title is, our number one job is to protect the presence of God. Because without the presence of God, we are nothing. Without the presence of God, we are nothing. Yes. Right, amen. Yes. They did not protect it. So the Bible said that after it was gone, the army, the Philistines, defeated the army of Israel. And this man from the tribe of Benjamin comes running into town. Notice what it said. This man went AWOL. He left when the times got tough. God's going to have to help me right here. This isn't really part of my sermon. Maybe I just feel it coming on. 
<clears throat> have you noticed that sometimes when going get tough, people get going? I see some heads shaking, but nobody's going to say amen on that one. That's okay. <laughs> sometimes when the going gets tough, people get going. That's, right, man. That's what happened to that man. We sang it a moment ago. If you're in the battle for the Lord and the right, you don't give up and run away. You don't run down to the church down the street because they've got different programs or different activities. You keep on the firing line. Amen. You stay the course. You yeah. keep the faith. You yes. win the battle. Yeah. You stay there and protect the presence of God. Don't let anybody take it from you. Yes. Yeah. So he comes running into town and notice he began to scream and to holler and to cry and moan so loud it got everybody's attention. Did anybody catch that? Oh, God help me here. You want to run me back to North Carolina tonight? Bless <laughs> the Lord. Those that normally go AWOL are normally the ones that moan and groan and gripe and complain the most Come on. that the battle's being won by the enemy. I've been in church all of my life. I'm a fourth generation holiness preacher, a third generation church of God minister. All I've ever known is church. And I can tell you emphatically that those people that will leave in the midst of the battle and go down to the church down town, they'll be the very ones that do this the most about your church. I've had it happen in my own church. Instead of staying and fighting, instead of staying and protecting the presence of God, they decide to go and moan until, oh, it's so bad down there. I just, I'm telling you, it's not church like it used to be. That's what this man did. He ran back into town, and instead of staying there and fighting, he comes in and starts crying to everybody. Oh, listen, the people of God, they're being defeated over there, and the people of God, they're losing their lives because the enemy has taken the ark of God. There was a man, a prophet there. The Bible says that this man... Eli. This man, Eli, was sitting there, 90-some years old, half blind, heavy, couldn't get up, was seated by the wayside. Notice what the Bible said about him. His heart trembled for the ark. I want to ask you a question tonight. When was the last time your heart trembled for the presence of God? Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. When was the last time you were awakened in the middle of the night? Hallelujah. And said, I've got to have his presence. Oh, thank you, God. When was the last time you were stirred on your job and had to walk away for a moment and pray and say, God, I'm stirred for your presence. When was the last time that you came into church on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or during revival and wept because you wanted the presence of God so great in your life? I want to tell you, friend, until his presence is more valuable than the very breath of our lives, until his presence is more valuable than the money we make, until his presence is more valuable than the position we hold or the title that we have, until his presence is so valuable that we tremble wanting to have it, we have failed the kingdom of God. Nothing is more important than having the presence of God in our lives. Yes. Nothing is more important than having His presence in the church. Oh, God, send a trembling in our heart. God, let us tremble tonight, wanting Your presence so badly we can taste it. The Bible said that as He sat there trembling for the presence of God, He calls over this man who had gone AWOL and He said, What's the meaning of this tumult? What's the reason for all of your crying? And he said, well, I have some bad news for you, sir. Israel's being defeated. I have some terrible news for you. Even in the midst of that, your two boys, Hophni and Phineas, are dead. And I can tell you as a parent, if I would have heard that news, I would have immediately broke down. I would have immediately just given up. But he did not ask about the army. He did not ask about his boys. What about mm -hmm. the presence of God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see where his concern was? 
I mean, I hate to tell you this, but even above your family, the presence is the most important thing in your life. Yes. What about the ark? Well, sir, the ark of God was taken. The Bible said that upon hearing that message, he immediately fell off of his seat backward and he died because he broke his neck. Nothing is ever put in Scripture for naught. There is always a reason for it to be in. When he heard that the ark of God was gone, he could not stand up, nor could he move forward. The only way he had to go was backwards. Because that's the direction the church goes when his presence is gone. And not only did he go backwards, but he fell. I mean, without his presence, that's exactly where the church is going. Attendance numbers are showing us that. Financial numbers are showing us that. Spiritual records are showing us that. The church is falling backwards and we're falling quick in America. But notice what it said. He broke his neck and died. Why was that so important? Because you see, the neck is the part of the body that connects the head with the body. Jesus is the head of the church. We are his body. He told Moses, it is at the presence of the ark. It is there that I will talk with you. It is there that I will commune with you. It is there that I will suck with you. I want to tell you, friend, the neck represented the Holy Ghost there. Because without the Holy Ghost in our midst, the head of the church has no way of communicating to the body. And when the head has no way of communicating with the body, the body will suffer and the body will die. Therefore, I want to tell you, in many cases, the neck is broken in the church. Jesus Christ, he has no connection with the people. He has no connection with his own body because the presence of God is gone. Honey, I hope you're hearing me tonight. Without his presence, we have no communication with him. Without his presence, we have no connection. Without his presence, we fall backward. Without his presence, we will die. Right, amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. The Bible says that as he died, news comes to his daughter-in-law, Mrs. Phineas. Mrs. Phineas was with child. She had something in her that needed to be birthed. Yet upon hearing the news that the ark of God was gone, the Bible said that her pains came upon her and she began to travail. Literally what was taking place is she was going into premature labor. Now in the midst of that premature labor, she began to give birth to a child that was going to be weak. Anybody ever known a preemie? A child that is born premature is often very weak, often needs extra help just to continue to make it. I want you to hear me right here. There are many churches within our denomination and abroad who have something in them that God is trying to birth. But when his presence is not there, we try to give birth to our programs. We try to give birth to our activity. We try to give birth to ministries too quickly. And they end up dying because they're weak. They're emaciated. They're tired. They have no strength to continue. You see, when his presence isn't there, what we needed to carry us to full birth is not there to help us get there. And therefore, our churches die off. Their ministries die off because his presence wasn't there to give birth the way it should be given birth. I want to ask you before I move on, what is God birthing in this church? What is God trying to birth through the Southwest Christian Center? Friend, I want to tell you, whatever that birth is, it will not be healthy. It will not be strong. It will not serve its purpose without the presence of God. Amen. 
The Bible said, and she starts giving birth. The women around her said, you should be happy. You're giving birth to a male child. The Bible says she did not regard it. Instead of being happy about it, instead of saying something joyful, she said, I want you to name him Ichabod. At that moment, she fulfilled the prophecy of Judges 2 and 10. There arose a generation after them which knew not the Lord nor the works which he had done in Israel. At that moment, she said, this generation will not know the power of God. This generation will not know the glory of the Lord because the presence of God is gone. You see, historically, it was the male who trained up the males in their culture. The father, it was his responsibility to train that child up in the things of God. But his daddy was dead. Yeah. He had nobody to do it. And culturally, when the father was dead, the wife had to allow his brother to help raise up seed unto him. So, so it should have been Hophni's job to train Phineas' son because Phineas is dead. He can't do it. But guess what? Hophni is gone. Culturally, if the sons are gone, the father-in-law, the grandpa of the boy, was to take up that child and show him the things of God. You see, the reason she had to call him Ichabod was because there was nobody there to pass on the presence of God. Jesus. There was nobody there to pray in tongues at 12 o'clock at night while your children listen. Come on. There was nobody in the church to give out a message in tongues and interpretation for the children to hear it. There was nobody in the congregation that gave a word of wisdom or knowledge or prophecy. They didn't see the worship of outward expression. They didn't hear the voices crying aloud in praise unto God. They had nobody to raise them up in the presence of the Lord. She said, just call him. The glory is departed. Because the ark of God is taken. <coughs> Southwest Christian Center on this Pentecost Sunday. More than anything in my life. More than anything in my life, I want his presence. Yes, Lord. More than anything in my life, I want to be in His glory. And I'm not talking about a trumped up joy, a sounding brass, or a tingling cymbal. I'm talking about the manifested presence of God. So I have come to a place in my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, I have. A bishop's license in my office. If the Lord tarries in next May, I will have a degree that says doctor. After almost 10 years of education. Through bachelor's, master's, and now my doctor. And yes, I have served. Evangelism boards, youth boards. I'm currently serving as state councilman of our home state. I, I have all those titles. I have all those things. But the number one goal. Yes, Lord. Yes. Is to be a protector of his presence. Hallelujah. Yes. 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 That way when my babies. 
Daddy's gone. My babies will know the glory of the Lord. Yes. My children will know what it is to pray through. Yes. They'll know what it is like to have the gifts and the fruit of the Spirit in the church. Yes, Lord. Yes. Because as long as I stand here, I'm not going the wrong direction. As long as I stand here, my battles will be won. As long as I stay here, His Word will be made manifest in me. As long as I stay here, the fruit of my ministry will continue to blossom. As long as I stay here, I'll have the nourishment to keep the faith and to keep going on. Yes. I've got to protect His yes, Lord. presence. Yes, Lord. Stand with me. Yes. Lift up your hands right now. I feel the holiness of God in this place. I feel the holiness of God in this place. Come on, lift up your hands. Lift up your hands and honor Him. In the presence of Jehovah, He's God Almighty. He's my prince of peace. Troubles vanish. Hearts are mended. In the presence of the I'm not going to ask you to do anything that you're uncomfortable with. But in this size crowd, we have plenty of room. I do not care if you walk down here. I do not care if you walk on the sides. I do not care if you walk in the back. I'm just asking you if you will make a step Hallelujah. toward His presence. Hallelujah. And say, God, I'm protecting your presence in my life and protecting the presence of God in my yes. church. I want you to step out right now, wherever you may be. Lift up your hands and your voice and your heart. Begin to cry out to God, I'm going to protect your presence.